The Seven Jewels of Chamar By Raymond F. Jones The bearded giant, Time Ormandy, raised stiffly on one arm from the bed of litter on the damp cave floor. He pointed the charred stub of his other arm at his son. Beware the fire bird. His voice was distorted with pain. She'll kill a thousand men for every one of the seven jewels of Chamar. Nathan Normandy threw back his rain cape and knelt beside his dying father. The great hulk of the old man sank back upon the rags. Did she do this? Nathan demanded fiercely. His eyes filled with flame at the sight of the terrible wound that had come from a shot in the back. Timer lay without answering. His eyes were closed. Nathan heard only the hushing sound of the eternal Venusian rains that blotted out the distant hills like a ragged curtain hung over the mouth of the cave. Behind Nathan another shaggy spaceman touched his shoulder. It was Tabor, his father's companion. The two police custodians from Aquatown shifted uneasily. Was it Firebird? Nathan demanded of the watchers. Before they could answer, Timer's remaining hand fell upon Nathan's wrist. There is more to tell, the old spaceman whispered. Nathan hunched lower to seize every word. What is it? The jewels of Chamar. Curse the jewels of Chamar. They stink with blood. I'd blast them all if I could. Timer's wide, steel eyes opened slowly. The leather of his face crinkled like finely tanned oskin. When you have looked into the blue depths of a stone that is like the eye of all the universe you'll never be able to turn your back upon it. You'll never rest until you have found all seven of the jewels, or death. Death is all that anyone has ever found. Ah, said Timer, but one man will find himself the master of all the universe when once he holds all seven of the jewels in his hands. That is the promise of the jewels, mastery, power. And I know that it is true. I've held them, as many as five of them eight once, and I know what it means. There's a force in them that sweeps through the brain and the soul. It lifts a man to power and strength beyond himself. Pa. Autohypnosis, or plain drunkenness. There are a thousand other names for it. No, said Timer softly. It's there, pure life force, or whatever it might be termed, but with those jewels one man would be as ten thousand men, each greater than any earth has produced. And you can be that man, Nathan. The old spaceman raised again from the bed. I bequeath to you the two jewels that I have left. There were three, but... Firebird? That does not matter. I warned you of her because she has sworn to have the jewels. I know she has two, maybe more. You'll have to kill her for them. Think what it would mean to the universe if that ruthless witch possessed the jewels. Hell would be let loose. The jewels are no concern of mine. I want to know only who did this to you. Timer sank back again. His voice whispered almost inaudibly, come closer. In the cave of Lava Mountain, he whispered hoarsely, do you remember the stone pick? The two jewels are there. It makes no difference who did this to me. Nothing matters but the jewels of Chamar. Take them and become master of the universe. Who did? Then Nathan's fury-laden voice ceased. The only sound was the hush of rain outside. Slowly Nathan's head bent low. His father was dead. Never again would time roar when his voice roar upon the spaceways or in the thousand tavern rendezvous of the spaceman. Tabor put his hand upon Nathan's shoulder. Sorry, son. Nathan rose. It was as if an electric charge had been thrust between the other men. I'll find the killer, said Nathan evenly. He looked down at the form on the cavern floor. I'll find him if it takes the rest of my life. Why did he warn me of Firebird? Was it only because of the jewels or do you think she could have done this? He hated Firebird because of an old quarrel. She might have done it, but I don't know. I was with Timer in Aquatown when he received a message saying information concerning the blue jewel could be found here. He went alone and we were to meet today later to leave for Mars. He didn't show up so I came here and found him like this. Nathan nodded. The policeman, Kleeg, had told him that much after Tabor had sent word. But that was no help. It only served to fix Nathan's hatred more intensely upon the cursed seven jewels of Chamar. Was my father carrying any of the jewels when he came here? He had the pink one. 
I tried to warn him, but he said he could take care of it. And now it's gone, of course. Tabor nodded. The whole thing was a trap by someone who knew he had it. Who knew of it? Half of Venus. He was drunk and boasting of it in the taverns the night before. That was time, Nathan thought, a great flagon of wine in one hand, boasting to the whole assemblage in some tavern, proclaiming his fabulous deeds upon the spaceways and challenging anyone to dispute his word with flame lances. Take care of things, will you? Nathan said abruptly. I'll get back to the town. What are you going to do? I think I know a way to trap the killer. The policeman and Tabor looked startled. Be careful, boy, said Tabor. Do you want me to go with you? No. Don't worry about me. Watch out for Firebird. She's on Venus now, and her father must have had a reason for his warning. Bah. She's nothing but a Calamity Jane legend. Have you ever traded flames with her? I've seen men who have. They weren't alive to tell about it. Spacemen dislike combat with a woman so you've built up a myth about her to give an excuse for not killing her. But if she is the one who killed my father she's going to pay for it. Then why not let the police bring her in? What police? Four planets have put a price on her head and she walks free and the cities of any of them. She's dangerous, Tabor repeated his warning. And perhaps she is not the killer after all. There's no use crossing her trail needlessly. We'll soon know, Nathan promised. He turned and strode out of the cavern of death while the two police officers began preparing his father's body for the trip back to the city under Tabor's direction. He paused a moment at the entrance and drew up the waterproof hood of his cloak and tied the knot beneath his chin, then went out into the sheeting rain. At the bottom of the step and slippery trail leading from the cave waited Perseus, the white stallion imported from Earth. In a world still battling incessantly against the jungle the horse was one of the chief means of private transportation, even though practically extinct on Earth. Perseus nuzzled against Nathan's neck and the man rested his face against the horse's head for a moment. Loneliness and weariness descended upon Nathan. He was lonelier than he had ever known he could be, he thought. Timer had never given much companionship to his son because their adventurous spirits had led them in opposite directions. But the mere knowledge of Timer's existence somewhere in the universe was the only companionship Nathan had needed. Now that was gone. And somewhere on Venus was a murderer he had to kill. 2. It was after dark when Nathan reached Aquatown. The streets of the Venusian frontier village literally flowed with water, proving the accuracy of its naming. Lights on the corners and in front of the taverns were ghostly blobs in the rain. Few Earthmen were about, but the little polite greenies of Venus swarmed the streets nodding and smiling when they saw Nathan. They knew and revered him as the great engineer from Earth who had brought lights and power to their wet, primitive world. Aquatown was only a frontier village with more than its quota of taverns to drain away the savings of the restless spacemen who stopped for a day or a week, waiting for a new cargo or for ship repairs in the nearby Universal Yards. Nathan's plan was fixed in his mind. He left Perseus at his lodgings and then headed for the taverns. The night's crowds were beginning to swarm in as he entered the first one. It was hot and steamy inside and the fog of smoke made it impossible to see the opposite wall. Bearded miners, lean adventurers, smooth-fingered confidence men were the customers. Dance hall girls who had come from Earth for the adventure and stayed because of the outer dejection with which Venus filled them were the men's companions for the most part. Nathan went directly to the bar and began ordering drinks. He grew more boisterous and his voice grew unsteady as he boasted and shouted of his good fortune in coming into possession of two of the jewels of Chamar. Then he left. He went to the next tavern and repeated the performance. During the night he made a tour of the taverns that would have done credit to old time Ormandy himself. And when the first light of Venusian dawn came he was stiff in the mobile in the last of the taverns. The bouncers pitched him out into the mud and rain as the place closed up. When he was alone Nathan rose and shook himself. He had accomplished his purpose. 
every thug and murderer on Venus knew by now that Nathan Normandy was going today to the secret cache of jewels left by his father. And Nathan knew that his father's killer would be not far behind as he moved up that mountain trail towards the cave in Lava Mountain. He made his way through the mud and slime of the streets to his own lodging. There, after a quick bath and breakfast, he armed and checked the charge in each of two flame lances. The weapons consisted of powerful electrodes with pistol grip handles. The electrodes were just less than 8 inches in length and full charge was a thousand rounds. Nathan pocketed them solemnly, wondering if one of those charges would avenge his father's death. He dressed in brown riding cape and donned a crimson helmet to make it easy to be followed. When he went out to the stable, Perseus seemed to sense the importance of their approaching mission and nickered eagerly. Nathan let the horse have his head and they raced along the forest trail behind the city and upward to the hills. The tree branches overhead dripped water that was already stagnant. And somewhere in those trees Nathan knew that outlaws of four planets were silently watching, waiting for him to lead them to part of the fabulous treasure for which three generations of adventurers had searched. His father's murderer was sure to be foremost among them. Nathan wondered if he could have saved his father's life by following him to the Starways years ago. Born aboard a spaceship, Timer had never claimed any planet for his own. He had tried to raise Nathan to be a starman like himself, but Nathan had seen the advancing wave of civilization beating upon the shores of alien planets and knew the only sure foundation would be built by the engineers, not by the wandering starmen. So he had chosen to fight the battles of engineering on primitive worlds. He was following the starways in a sense, but it broke Timer's heart when Nathan became civilized. Then seven years ago Timer had dedicated the remainder of his life to the recovery of the fabled, mysterious jewels of Chamar. The story of the cursed jewels was obscure. No one knew their origin. There was little more than the age-old myth that to hold all seven would make a man master of the universe, but to hold less than seven would bring eventual death. The latter at least was no myth, Nathan thought grimly. The trail became steep as the trees thinned and the horse broke out upon the hillside. There was a moment of sunlight blinding in its beauty. Then dark clouds closed over again. Nathan rode out along a ridged rail where he was silhouetted against the sky. He stood for a moment, making himself as conspicuous as possible to the unseen followers he knew were behind him. Ahead, the tall spire of Lava Mountain loomed against the grey blanket of the sky. It seemed near in its majestic might, but it was nearly midday when Nathan reached the foot of it. The sight of the mountain at close range brought back a thousand memories to Nathan. He had spent much of his boyhood here and this was where Timer had taught him in the rugged ways of living of the spaceman. Here he had learned from Timer and Tabor to master the flame lance until there was hardly a spaceman that could match his skill. The mouth of the great cavern was in sight now, high up on the face of the mountain. He hoped the narrow trail he and Timer had so laboriously cut out was still there. It appeared to be. He guided the horse up the beginning of the steep cut. He drew out one of the flame lances now and kept the sharp watch on the trail below. He knew that he was in no danger from anyone with the sense of calculation. That type of renegade would wait until Nathan had recovered the jewels before attacking. But some brainless fool might try to pick them off now and search the cave on his own. From far down the trail came the sudden clatter of rocks as a slide was started by a careless step, but no one was visible behind the ridges. Nathan had a clear view of his last tower's ride. So far, he was in the clear. He looked cautiously at the cliff above him. Attack from that tangle was not entirely impossible, especially if Firebird was in the vicinity. He knew she would not be with the followers behind him. But now the last 200 feet of the steep trail were before him. The great maw of the cavern was like a black cloud against the dirty white rock of the mountain. He touched his heels sharply to the flanks of the horse, and Perseus leapt up the incline in long jumps that carried horse and rider on into the black cave. Instantly, Nathan leapt off and flung himself behind a giant stalagmite, half expecting a flame ball to be hurled at him from out of the darkness. But a flame would have been welcome after the darkness and silence that pervaded the place. 
only the distant sounds of the now emboldened pursuers came from the ridge below. Nathan moved to the entrance and obtained his first glimpse of the pursuers. A battle skirmish had broken out between them. He had expected that. A man who had already killed for the jewels would not welcome competition. Nathan moved back and ordered the horse into a niche in the wall. He was dismayed somewhat by the number of men he had seen on the trail. There were at least twenty taking part in the skirmish and doubtless more were hidden from his sight. Determining the murderer would be difficult in such a mob. The stalagmite which Nathan and his father had called the Stone Pig was nearly a half mile back into the mountain along a tortuous trail. He could not be sure that falling stalactites had not blocked the way, so Nathan was forced to risk a light after leaving the mouth of the cave. The cave was hot. Steamy fog filled the air as he came at last to the small room of the Stone Pig. He knew that some of his pursuers must be near the cavern by now. He needed time to get to a hidden gallery overlooking the path they would have to traverse. Nothing seemed changed from the time he had last been near the Stone Pig. The grotesquely formed stalagmite was shiny with moisture and its enigmatic grin seemed to challenge Nathan to find out the things it had seen while he had been gone. A sense of excitement and anticipation seized Nathan despite his efforts to control his feelings. He thought of the boyhood days when he had hidden secret maps and strange and precious formulae beneath the stone pig. Now he was to see for the first time the fabulous gems that had cost so many lives, including his father's. He pushed the stalagmite and it toppled over heavily. In the small, hollow space beneath it lay the same metal can that he had used so long ago. He pried open the lid. There lay the jewels, one green, one red. But the gasp that escaped his lips at their sudden beauty was smothered in the sudden roar of deafening thunder that came from the cavern mouth far behind him. He jerked to his feet. The air compression waves staggered him so that he tottered drunkenly for a moment and the sound battered his body. A flood of dust-laden air flowed over him. Then gradually it settled about the chamber and there was only silence once more. Nathan looked back at the box. A cleverly arranged switch had closed when he opened the lid, exploding the thunderous charge at the mouth of the cave. He struggled mentally with the problem of who had placed the explosive and the switch to seal the cave. Perhaps Timer had placed it as protection against robbery and his mind had been so affected by his wounds that he had forgotten it. Or someone might have planted it as a trap. But, if so, why were the jewels left? Almost forgetting that he was sealed in the cavern, he knelt down beside the box. The inner light of the jewels pierced his eyes and seized his mind in a hypnotic trance. For an instant he thought he was gazing upon the beauties of some fair and alien world. In the red one there was a fantastic garden of Mars, but a Mars where no red sand clouds ever covered the cities with smothering death. And in the green one he saw a fair and lovely vision of Earth so real it pierced him with nostalgia. Then the visions faded. Whether he actually saw them or they were figments of imagination he never knew. But he had to shake his head and tear his sight away from the jewels in order to pocket them. Then, as he turned away, there broke upon the air high-pitched song that trailed the moment's melody. It hung as if a crystal were suspended in the cavern, echoing its vibrations from chamber to chamber. It came again. Nathan straightened and put out the light. He whipped out both flame lances. It was the song of the firebird. Nathan darted out of the room of the stone pig, guided by his intimate knowledge of the cavern. He waited a moment by the entrance, listening in the darkness. Then he heard the soft scrape of a sandal against a rock somewhere. And a voice. Nathan Ormandy. It called his name softly, echoing in the cavern, and it was like no other voice he had ever heard. The music of its silver tones was brilliant and glowing like the inner light of the jewels of Chamar themselves. I have come for you, Firebird, said Nathan. Ready your flame lance. He darted away, expecting a flame to be hurled at the sound of his voice. None came. He waited, hoping Firebird would answer and give him a target. That first sound of her voice haunted him. It was the loveliness of a spring day on earth the blue of the sky and the song of the birds, but it was the song of the firebird, a song of death. Then she answered.
I came to make peace, Nathan. Put up your lance and make a light. He aimed in the darkness, and could not fire at that voice. Do you think I'm a fool? He muttered savagely. It was to himself as well as to Firebird. You are a fool. Firebird hissed in anger. I came to you peacefully. From across the chamber a ball of fire the size of an orange spurted with the speed of lightning. It splattered the wall two feet from Nathan. The heat of its explosion singed his cape to a shred. His face was scorched and his eyes blinded temporarily. Nathan aimed again and unleashed the blast of his own, but it went wide for he did not even glimpse Firebird in its glow. He leapt away to hiding behind a large stalagmite. Listen to me. The voice of Firebird commanded again. I could have killed you then. My shot landed two feet to the left of you. Now will you hear what I have to say? It's easy to call your shots after they are fired. Here's one neither to the right or left, said Firebird evenly. Before she finished speaking a blast of flame burst over the huge stalagmite in front of Nathan. The fire of it flowed around the sides and enveloped him in a searing blanket. For the first time, Nathan knew fear. The witch could see in the dark. He was at her mercy. Her voice spoke more softly now. Are you coming out from behind there or do I have to come and get you? You'll have to come and get me, the same way you got my father. He leapt the way to still another stalagmite. He paused midway to unleash his own burst from the flame lance. It splashed against the cavern wall, but there was no answering fire. He waited tensely in the darkness. Minutes passed. Surely he could not have killed the firebird with that blast. The silence could only mean then that she was holding her fire, creeping up on him in the darkness. You have no excuse for my father's murder? Nathan taunted. He slipped away to another protecting rock. Then the voice of Firebird came again, and she hadn't moved. Nathan's eyes tried hopelessly to pierce the blackness to check the evidence of his ears. Firebird said, I was just wondering what I could say to a fool like you. If I killed your father for the jewels why do you suppose that I didn't take them and go? Why should I have left them, and prepared the trap to destroy the cave mouth? Is there anyone who knows the mysterious ways of the thief and killer, Firebird? I have never stolen except from thieves. I have never killed, except murderers. My father was not a murderer. And I did not kill him. Your father and I were partners for many years. We searched together for the seven jewels. I don't believe that. He warned me against you. Yes. Because we quarreled. I'll tell you about it someday. Together, we found five of the seven jewels. One of his three was stolen by the murderer. Now, there are four of the jewels equally dividing between you and me. It is senseless for us to fight. There is power enough for us both when the seven are ours. In return for your cooperation I promise to help you find your father's murderer. You know my reputation well enough to know what my promise means. And remember, I could have taken the jewels instead of bargaining with you, but the Firebird is not a thief. Nathan didn't believe a word of what she said, but he knew that if he continued to challenge Firebird with the flame lance it would not take her a dozen shots to find him in the darkness. Though he had been taught by Timer he could not match such shooting. He would be lucky to find her with a hundred shots. No wonder her prowess had become a legend. I'll compromise, with one reservation, he said. I think you killed my father. I know you can kill me here in the darkness. I don't know why you don't. I'll accept your offer, but unless you prove you did not kill my father, you and I will sometime again trade flames to the death. Done, said Firebird. Almost instantly, a pink glow began filling the chamber. It was like the rising of the sun over one of Earth's quiet seas. There seemed to be the perfume of flowers in the air, and the song of birds. And then Nathan realized it was Firebird's song, that high-pitched melody that caused a faint chill to race the length of his spine. The glow, too, was coming from her. It heightened with a tremendous, terrifying crescendo. Nathan had heard babbling outlaws who swore drunkenly to having seen this sight. He stood immobile now, not breathing in the face of the wondrous glory of that unfolding light.
The firebird herself was so dazzling that the pink radiance blinded him after the darkness, but when his eyes became accustomed to it he saw her. She was small, almost tiny, and exquisitely shaped. Her head was encased in a close-fitting silver helmet that did not prevent her flowing, raven hair from tumbling over the nape of her neck. As she stood there in the rising glow she seemed poised for flight. A close-fitting tunic that seemed to be of scarlet-tinted mail protected her body, but her arms and legs were barren from her very flesh the pink light was emanating. Nathan murmured, half to himself, beautiful, and inhuman. Who are you? The firebird smiled. And Nathan moved slowly towards her. It was incredible that such evil as he had heard of the firebird could have come out of such beauty. Perhaps you shall know who I am someday. For now, our agreement does not call for that. Would you mind pocketing your flame lance before we go on? Nathan realized his hand still gripped the weapon and it was trained on the girl. It would take only a squeeze of his finger to erase her evil. Better not try it, she warned, and the smile did not leave her lips. He looked down at her hand. Her own weapon was trained with equal sureness upon him. Instinctively, then, he knew that all the stories about the fabulous quick draw of the Firebird were true. If he so much as thought of killing her, her finger would squeeze the trigger of her flame lance a thousand times quicker than his. He pocketed the weapon slowly and smiled at her. How do we get out? He said. Is the passage locked? Completely, Firebird said. Or else the gentlemen who were so anxious to meet you here would have arrived by now. You planted the explosive? Yes. I wanted our interview in private, not amidst the battle. How do you know there is any other way out? Your father and I built it long ago. Nathan remained silent. Was it only some purposeful fiction, or had his father actually been partners with Firebird? She turned her back upon him and led the way out of the chamber by her own mysterious radiance. He could draw his flame lance now, Nathan thought. But it was only a thought. He wondered if he could ever seek vengeance upon such beauty regardless of what she had done in the past. There was a temptation almost stronger than vengeance now, a temptation to see this whole affair all the way through, to find out the true identity of the fabled Firebird and the secret of the Seven Jewels of Chamar. For a time they walked towards the blocked entrance. Then they turned abruptly aside into a narrow passage. The slim firebird passed through easily but for Nathan it was a tight squeeze that grew narrower as he went. A strangling sense of claustrophobia seized him. He pressed almost frantically to get past the bottleneck. If this were a trap firebird could shoot before he could get a hand near a weapon. Then he saw her waiting for him ahead in the larger chamber to which the narrow passage led. She seemed to read his thoughts. Do you trust me now? Does anyone really trust the Firebird, anyone on the Nine Worlds? The sudden sobering of her face was a terrible thing to see. She turned away so hastily that Nathan barely saw the expression, but he saw enough to know that there was weakness in her. She was not all iron strength. He saw enough to know that the incredible, storied Firebird had no friend in all the system and he knew what that fact meant to her. Nathan had never been in the part of the cavern which they were entering. He knew the narrow passage must have been covered by a thin shell of rock in his time. They came at last into chamber that was the equal in size of the main one. There was daylight visible and the pink radiance from Firebird began to die. When it was gone she seemed smaller and more fragile than ever. Only the little blue lights in her eyes seemed hard and unyielding. Within the chamber Nathan stopped and gasped. There was the glistening, silver hull of a space cruiser. And high on the nose of it was the dread name, Corsair. Corsair, the famed pirate vessel that had outrun every ship that had ever pursued it. In a hundred acts of piracy, the Firebird had escaped without leaving a trace by means of the Corsair. She watched as he admired the ship. Like it? So this is the famous Corsair, he said, and her hideout. You must be sure of your ability to win me as an ally or to kill me. I am, sure of both. But I need you more as an ally. Shall we go in? 
the need to like Paul housed the long, spiral catway that led to the cabins and control room. Halfway to the nose Firebird showed Nathan a tiny cabin which he could use. You'll find a supply of clothing, she said. I find it necessary to prepare for occasional guests who forget to bring luggage. Guests taken from space liners in the midst of interplanetary space, Nathan thought. He wondered what had become of the many that the Firebird had kidnapped that way. And now the control room, she said. I want you to become familiar with the operation of the ship. All the ships that Nathan had ever known seemed like clumsy skulls beside this splendid vessel. Every device known to space navigation and combat was in the equipment. And many instruments he failed to recognize. Who designed the ship? My father. Father, somehow Nathan found himself unable to associate the Firebird with any of the normalcies of life. Who was your father? Her smile was wry. A man who was little known during his lifetime. He didn't pursue the subject, they could go into that later. He said, what I'm interested in is what do we do now? We are going to find the other three jewels. One of them is in the hands of your father's murderer. We do not need to worry about losing track of that because he will follow us. You know who it is? Yes, but you would not believe me. Tell me. He stepped forward, his big hands closing as if upon the throat. Our bargain, the girl reminded him. The jewels first, I swear we'll not lose him. The other jewels, where are they, then? One of them is buried inaccessibly in a mountain on Mars. The other is in the possession of one of three outlaws, all of whom are on Mars. I have traced it to one of them. So that is where we are going. How do you know who has them? That's a long story, said Firebird, and one that has cost many years of my life. And would have cost more without time or help. I'd like to know more of your story about him. He never told me until he died that he had known you. It can wait. Satisfied that the controls were in order, the girl turned her attention to the engines. There's trouble in the port motor, she said. It can't be repaired with the facilities available to us here, we'll have to take a chance using it. Nathan was about to protest, then changed his mind. He and his father had gone into space so often with decrepit and half-worn equipment that it should have made no difference, but this vessel was so sleek and perfect that danger seemed to lurk in any minor imperfection. Nathan strapped himself into the inertia controlling chair next to Firebird. He studied the duplicate controls in front of him but kept his hands off. Firebird started the warming coils to preheat the tubes. After a moment she adjusted the ignition controls and twisted the fuel valve. Nathan felt as if he had been slapped suddenly with a giant pillow that pressed him flat in the chair. The acceleration of the Corsair was greater than any he had experienced before, and his father's old ship had never been equipped with inertia chairs. He caught no glimpse of the edge of the cavern's maw as the ship passed upward through it. One instant they were in the cave, the next they were in the sky and only seconds passed until they were soaring above the thick cloud layer of Venus. After five minutes of such intense acceleration, the Firebird relaxed and cut the controls to a point where they could breathe more easily. Why the hurry? Nathan gasped. Nobody is chasing us. Firebird made no answer. She reached towards the small panel at the lower edge of the control board and switched on the viewing plate. Silently, she scanned the heavens behind them and the surface of the planet they were leaving. The focus of the plate extended and retreated, then suddenly it concentrated upon a blunt-nosed black vessel rising somewhere below them. The black warrior, said Firebird. He was watching for us to leave. Nathan watched the black ship for hours while Firebird guided the chorus air. Steadily the strange vessel gained on them. We could outrun him easily, said Firebird, if it weren't for that bad motor. Do you know how to handle light cruiser lances? My father never carried the gun on his ship in his life. I remember, said Firebird, how I used to argue with him. He said he wouldn't risk being caught by the police in an armed vessel, so he never came aboard the Corsair. Perhaps a wiser man than his son said Nathan. He told himself he wanted no part of this.
he was an engineer, not the buccaneer. Yet as the black vessel approached he felt the thrill of its challenge. The challenge of combat in the impersonal depths of space. His father had felt that challenge, the challenge of men and of space itself, and he had met it with his own bare hands. It was impossible for Nathan not to feel it. They kept their steady pace at an acceleration something more than 15 Gs. Firebird gave Nathan brief instructions in the operation of the weapons and controls. A viewing screen provided Nathan with sights. Its skate automatically corrected for the relative motions of the two vessels. Abruptly, and without warning, the Black Warrior fired. The Corsair's defensive screens caught the blast with an absorption of energy that made the dissipators whine and grow incandescent. He's using high-powered stuff, said Nathan. Those screens can't take much of that. They weren't meant to. The Corsair's main defense is her speed. There wasn't room for heavy screens. This time our defense has to be better shooting. Watch this. As she spoke, she caught the enemy ship dead in the sights and depressed the firing button. A cloud of bright vapor seemed to envelope the black hull. Then all was as before. He's got our screens beat, said Nathan. We'll never get to them. Firebird smiled. That's the first time that's been said in the chorus air. I hope your pessimism doesn't jinx us. The black ship was swinging back, maneuvering closer. Hang on. Firebird exclaimed. She flung the Corsair into a tight turn and held it. Simultaneously, she fired the four big lances in the stern and left a trail of flame balls that made it impossible for the enemy to follow in their wake. Then, forcing the ship into a closed spiral, she nosed towards the black ship and fired the four forward lances together. Nathan watched, his hands clenched to knuckle whiteness on the control panel, as the four flames combined and enveloped the enemy. This time the black warrior's screens flamed lividly. The big ship heeled crazily away, twisting under the forces unleashed upon it. But the black ship was vicious in its death agonies. Nathan saw its beams lash out and yelled to Firebird, don't cross his stern. Firebird saw her mistake. Both of them twisted as the dual controls to swing the Corsair away from that cone of destruction into which it was plunging. It was too late. They swept across the stern of the Black Warrior which was blasting with all it had. The Corsair's screen lit momentarily. Then the dissipators exploded in a crashing blast in the depths of the ship. The interior of the control room came alive with flame. Firebird flung her hands before her face and her silver helmet was encased in a halo of fire. What protected him, Nathan never knew, but he seemed to be just outside the sphere of burning destruction that burst through the walls of the control room in a hundred million pint pricks of flame. For an eternity he seemed frozen there watching the flame creeping over the slim form of Firebird, watching it burn and smother her. Automatic cells closed the innumerable pinpricks made in the hull by the entering ions of fire. The control panel was blackened and burned. Then the flame points faded out. His hypnosis induced by the flame could not have lasted more than a fraction of a second, Nathan knew. But when he leapt out of the chair towards Firebird, he shuddered. The bronze and pink of her flesh was burned to blackness. It was impossible, he told himself numbly. This couldn't be the end of the storied Firebird. But it was. That charred corpse could never hold life again. A poignant pain of sorrow filled him as he looked upon the figure and remembered the beauty of Firebird. He felt lost, and all the supreme purpose in their flight to Mars had ceased. His mind drifted back to the scene in the cave when he had witnessed his father's death. He recalled the words his father had spoken, you'll never rest until you have found all seven of the jewels, or death. That's the way it had been with Time Ormony. That's the way it had been with Firebird. All they had found was death. Then, with a shock of horror, Nathan realized that was the way it would be with him, too. His father's words were true. He would never rest until he had found the secret of those evil jewels or suffered the same fate that had befallen all the other spacemen who'd given their lives in that vain search. But he'd find those jewels, he knew. And someday he'd know the secret of the beautiful, the fantastic Firebird. He wondered if his father's murder had been avenged with the death of Firebird.
and he knew that he would never be sure as long as he lived. Nathan cut the acceleration of the ship, and then bent over to unfasten the straps that held her in the inertia chair. Tenderly he picked up the light body that had held the strong will of Firebird. He took a step towards the passage leading to the airlocks. And then he stopped in horror. The blackened lips of Firebird moved. There was no sound. Only the ghostly movement of those lips to show that Firebird lived. This was worse than death, Nathan thought. But she could not live long. He carried her to her own stateroom and laid her on the bed. He bent down and heard the faint beating of her heart. From a cabinet he obtained subs and drugs to ease the pain when and if she regained consciousness. Even as he finished she began to stir. She moved as if in tremendous pain, and facial expression was impossible for her. Her lips moved again. But there was no sound. If she should live, he knew he ought to head for Earth where the only adequate medical facilities were. But it was a long journey to the other side of the sun this time of year. The defunct motor would make it even longer. It seemed impossible that she could survive the trip. The lips of Firebird were still moving, and now Nathan caught the trace of a word. He bent closer. She repeated the same sound over and over again. Lulin, Lulin, was the word she breathed. It made no sense to him. He wondered if the name were that of some unknown relative, or if she were merely delirious. Lulin, Lulin, take me to Lulin. He spoke gently into her ear. Who is Lulin? She struggled mightily within herself against the pain waves attacking her. She gasped, chart CR 46. Lulin. Nathan raced to the chart room. There it was. On chart CR 46, circled in red, was the word Lulin beside a tiny asteroid. This was more incomprehensible than ever. Or was the asteroid a burial place for her mysterious clan? He debated heading for Earth. And then another question arose as he thought of her burned and tortured body. Even if she could live would she want to? On Earth her existence would be in the double prison of iron bars and her own damaged body. He set the course for the asteroid, Lulin. V. Slowly, in the depths of black space there swelled the blob of rock that was the half-mile diameter of Lulin. As the ship approached, Nathan examined the surface through the screens for a clue to Firebird's reason for wanting to go there. But it looked the same as any other of the thousands of rocks floating through the spacelands. The only unusual feature was a small bright spot that appeared to be about 10 feet in diameter. It was centered in the bottom of a large depression on one side of the rock. Firebird seemed to sense the presence of the asteroid as they neared. Her body twitched nervously. Or perhaps it was only her increasing battle with the powers of death. When Nathan told her they had arrived she struggled her eyes. She fell back helplessly. The pool, she mumbled through lips that barely moved. Bury me in the pool of Lulin. Though he had guessed it, Nathan was moved to pity because Firebird had known for so many hours that she was going to her own grave. But he wondered what she meant by the pool of Lulin. Was it that bright spot he had noticed? There could be no liquid out here in the depths of space. It was difficult to land a familiar ship on an asteroid, and since Nathan had never landed the Corsair anywhere it was next to impossible to make an accurate landing. But the urgency of Firebird's desire told him it was worth the risk of taking the ship down upon the jagged surface of the strange little rock. He swept around it in an ever-narrowing spiral until he finally came low over the wide depression that held the shining pool. He dropped the ship rapidly, breaking the Corsair and letting it arc upwards to a stall. Swiftly, Nathan cut the propulsion tubes. The forward brakes dropped the ship to the surface. The Corsair settled with a hard jolt. A poor landing but good under the circumstances. Nathan hurried back to the stateroom of the Firebird. There he halted in the doorway at the sight that met his eyes. The firebird had risen from the bunk and was standing in the middle of the room swaying like some disjointed robot, gibbering wildly through her nerveless lips. She was facing the port and shaking the stump of her hand at the shining pool visible outside. Nathan caught her frantic words. Air there, no suit. She was hysterical. He made up his mind. 
The life of Firebird was no more than a candle flame and a hurricane now. The least he could do was grant her final wishes. If she wanted him to end her life by thrusting her out into the cold of interplanetary space and bury her in the pool it would be only merciful. He donned a spacesuit quickly and went back to Firebird. She had collapsed unto unconsciousness and lay in a pitiful huddle in the middle of the floor. Perhaps she was already dead, he thought. Carrying her, he entered the airlock and paused the moment it required for evacuation. It seemed to take an unusually short time to equalize the pressure, then he stepped out. He had expected the body of Firebird to become distorted and instantly frozen by the cold, but she changed not at all as he stepped to the surface of the asteroid, held down by the traction shoes of the suit. He checked the thermometer on his sleeve. Only 30 degrees below zero, and not falling. He approached the pool that glistened like a shining disk of metal in the brilliant sunlight. He kicked the stone onto it, and ripples arose. It was liquid, and very dense, like a pool of mercury. He came to the edge and looked one last time at the face of Firebird, the one's beautiful Firebird. Then slowly, she dropped from his arms into the pool. He stepped back and watched. For an instant it seemed as if she lay in the surface, half submerged and unmoving. Then still fingers of waves rose about her and dragged her beneath. Abruptly she was gone. It was as if she had disappeared into the surface of a mirror. The depths of the liquid were invisible. The unmoving surface reflected only the white hot light of the pool into Nathan's eyes. Firebird was gone. And with her disappearance there came to Nathan the conviction that there had been nothing evil in her. She had moved because she was driven by some wild and secret purpose that would not give her rest. A purpose bound up in the seven jewels of Chamar. And Nathan knew that somehow he would find the secret of the jewels that had driven his own father to death. He suddenly turned and ran back towards the ship. He wanted to get away as quickly as possible from this unreal world of Lulin. It was a place that breathed the presence of strange and alien ghosts. He would come back, though, he would return to solve the mystery of Firebird after he had been to Mars and obtained the remainder of the jewels. The Corsair rose slowly from Lulin. He let the great ship circle once about the mass of rock, then turn into space towards Mars. He focused his viewing screen and glanced back at the tiny rock. The pool reflected the sun's rays like a great heliograph. Even at this distance it was too bright to gaze it for long. His only goal now was possession of all of the seven jewels. Firebird had not shown him her two, but he knew they were somewhere within the ship. The vision of the glorious depths of the two in his own possession constantly floated before him as he let his thoughts drift back to them. He understood now the spell to which his father had succumbed. He reached to turn the viewing screen off, but glanced for one last time at the asteroid. Suddenly the light reflected from the pool flickered and wavered. It was as if some hand were holding a giant mirror and shifting it back and forth, flashing some mysterious message across the depths of space, he thought. No doubt it was due to some peculiarity of refraction caused by the remnant of air that seemed to lie with the cup of the depression. He turned to the charts and concentrated on the course. He checked the position of Mars now and what it would be at his estimated time of arrival. He put the figures into the computer. The answer came out fantastically wrong. He tried again and failed. It was impossible to concentrate. And he knew why. That shifting reflection from the pool of Lulin. That unintelligible message flashed across space. It could have been caused by the breaking of the surface of the pool. It had to be caused by that. And it would haunt him forever unless he turned back. He swung the Corsair into a turn that blacked out his vision, but when he could see again he was headed for the asteroid once more. He came in too fast. He had to circle twice to break his speed. Then the Corsair sped down into the depression and over the pool. Piloting required too much attention to keep a close watch on the shiny surface, but one brief glance brought a gasp from his throat. There was something lying at the edge of the pool that had not been there before. His landing this time was made with a terrific jolt that rocked the ship. Then he entered the lock without waiting to don a spacesuit. 
He knew that Firebird had been right when she said it was unnecessary. He kept the inner door of the lock closed to conserve the heat in the ship, but he swung the outer door open and plunged out. He staggered in sudden pain as the shock of meeting that alien atmosphere swept over him. It was not atmosphere by any human standard. It was verified beyond capacity to support normal human life. He gasped in desperate breaths and the ice needles he breathed upon the air were sucked back into spare his own lungs. Black checkerboard screens flashed across his vision, but he could see now the object at the edge of the pool. There was no questioning the instinct that had driven him to turn back the chorus air. Firebird lay huddled on the rocks by the pool. She lay as if she had been running and had fallen forward on her face. Nathan reached her and turned her over. He stared in unbelief. The swaths and bandages had vanished in the pool and her body lay white and cold under the strong light of the sun. There was not a mark on her. The mystic properties that lay in the strange pool had performed the miraculous resurrection and healed all traces of the ghastly burns. Nathan did not know whether she was yet alive or dead. She was icy to his touch and unconscious, but he picked her up and started back to the ship. The exertion in that atmosphere caused swirls of dizziness in his brain, and he did not even ponder the question of how gravity could be great enough to make walking possible. He expanded every fraction of his draining energy to fight back to the ship. At last he laid Firebird inside the lock of the Corsair and closed the outer door with the last dregs of his strength. Automatically, the lock began to fill with warm air until the inner door swung open. Nathan's strength revived shortly. He turned to Firebird. Her black hair that spilled over the floor of the lock looked as if it had never been touched by the destroying fire. Her face was molded in the same lines of perfection as before. And her flesh was beginning to glow with the pink of life. The final miracle showed itself in her breathing. She was alive. He carried her into the stateroom and wrapped her in blankets. Her body was still icy from her long exposure. He started to move away to get a hot drink when she should revive. Then her eyes opened. She looked wildly about, then stared at him. I thought you had abandoned me. Did your conscience get the better of you? The hardness of her voice shocked him. He looked at her in pained surprise. I thought you were dead. I saw the flickering of the light from the pool when you came out of it. I came back then only because I couldn't believe you had really died. Of course. You couldn't really know, could you? Abruptly she was crying. He sat down and took her hand. There is no one else in the system who would not have been glad to leave Firebird there forever, she said. Nathan made no reply. He could not comprehend her strangeness. But for the moment she was no longer the fearless firebird. She was a little girl, lonely and lost.